Thank you for coming. Why don't we begin with a prayer and then we'll uh, march right into things, shall we? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Sacred Heart of Jesus, Immaculate Heart of Mary, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our talk this evening is about uh, being a member of the church militant in the 21st century. And uh, some of you may know uh, that uh, prior to last summer, the name of our little apostolate was um, uh, St. Michael's Media slash RealCatholicTV.com. And when we changed the name over to Church Militant, a couple of people sent us some emails and said, well, that sounds very hostile. And we're like, oh, they apparently don't know what the reference to the church militant is. So for the benefit of some folks who may not know specifically what the church talks about when it talks about the church militant, it's a uh, one-third of the reference to uh, the communion of saints, which we talk about in the creed. We have the church triumphant in heaven, which one day we will all hopefully be in. We have the church suffering or the church purgative, purgatory, who are saved but on their way to perfection. And us, the church militant, the reference to being fighting. So at least on the hostile part, they're kind of right. It is uh, a reference to fighting, but uh, uh, Pope, uh, I believe it was Pope Pius IX, I may have the Pope wrong, but the Pope said we, call, we are called the church militant because we endure so many attacks because we are fighting for the truth. And the idea of what our goal here is on earth has really been lost on many, many, many Catholics. Many Catholics. Now, sometimes it's many times. It's not uh, the individual Catholic's fault. We all know that there's been kind of a collapse uh, still ongoing in many places or continuing uh, in uh, good and effective catechesis and actual teaching of the faith and passing it on. That's been uh, a very big problem and still very much is. We know that there is also uh, uh, a big problem transmitting the faith faithfully, so much so that some people who are members of the church militant have no idea they're in the church militant. That's a bit of a problem. We don't see as Catholics today that we are in a fight, yet every single thing we look at in the tradition of the church, in scripture, in the lives of the saints, in the lives and the writings and the teachings of the doctors of the church, the fathers of the faith, all of these. All of this is all about fighting. St. Paul talks, says near the end of his life, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. He says to the Ephesians, put on the armor of God. Everything in our tradition is about fighting. Last April, I believe it was last April, about a year ago, uh, our Holy Father then, Pope Benedict, uh, made reference and said the term ecclesi ecclesia militans is not used very much, church militant, is not used very much anymore, but it is the true essence of who we are here on earth. And we don't think in those terms. And the reason we don't think in these terms is because there's too much union between the church and the world right now. So, so many people in the church have bought into, because they see it everywhere else in their lives, every aspect of their lives, this kind of uh, non-militaristic way of being. And if we talk in terms of, you know, well, this is right, that's a strong, bold statement. And the world will tell you, no, you're, no that's just your opinion. There's 100,000 different opinions on this matter. Thank you for your opinion, but it's just an opinion. And then when you come back and say, no, it is not an opinion, it is right. And everything in contradiction to it is wrong. Everything that 
partially agrees with it, but partially disagrees with it, is only partially right. You talk like that, and you're a homophobe, you're a bigot, you don't understand, you're against pluralism, how can you survive in the 21st century? We have democracies, everybody's right about everything. Don't you know that? Doesn't matter what it is, we're all right. No one's wrong. If you say somebody's wrong, you hurt their feelings, you degrade them, you destroy their self-esteem, and you, of course, send them to hell. Because this is what we're talking about at the end of the day. What we are fighting is hell, is Satan. But we can't talk in those terms either, right? Because, oh, that's just that religious malarkey. That's not really true. That's just a myth. And we hear these arguments inside the church. It's all a myth. We all get to have, you know, all have to be Catholic. Be a good Lutheran. That's good enough. No, it's not good enough. I had a discussion, uh, well, a short discussion, with a priest, Monsignor, on the phone in uh, uh, D.C., who was in charge of a sort of highfalutin office. You have that expression in, here in Australia, highfalutin? Falutin, I don't even know what that means. It just says, you know. So there's this highfalutin office, and he's in charge of evangel evangelization. And I was, he'd written an article, if I, I, I think that's why I called him. I, he, he'd written an article or somebody had written something about something that we'd posted and then he responded to it. But somehow, something he said was out there in the public. And I thought, well, that's weird. I don't understand. I mean, here's a guy that's got 5,000, you know, alphabets after his name, very smart, 6 million degrees. And I'm reading this and I have no idea what he's saying. I guess I'm just the dummy. So I called him up and said, hello, Monsignor, blah, blah, blah. And I was talking to him. I said, you know, that's all fine and good. I don't understand this and this. Let me ask you something that I do understand. Just yes or no, do you think everybody in the world should be Catholic? Yes or no? This is Monsignor in charge of evangelization. And here was the answer I got. Well, um, you know, it kind of depends on some circumstances. I'm like, thank you very much, Monsignor, but I couldn't disagree with you more. And we hung up, and that was the end of the conversation. When you have that sort of lack of certitude inside your own camp, how are you ever going to be able to get out as an organization, as a community, and move forward? You know, I used to do, uh, uh, produce commercials for General Motors about 10 years ago before I started doing all of this uh, uh, apostolic church work, work of the apostolate. And if we would ever have sat in one of our meetings, one of our marketing meetings, and we were making up commercials and that sort of thing, and scheduling how we were going to shoot them and where we were going to shoot them, all that, if somebody in one of those meetings would have said, you know, I know we make General Motors cars, but, you know, Fords or Hondas are kind of cool too. Maybe we should encourage people to look at those as well. Here's your pink slip, thanks very much. And likewise, I've never run into the whole Planned Parenthood side of the equation or the culture of death that are sitting over there questioning themselves. Nobody on Planned Parenthood ever makes the exception and says, well, you know, those pro-life people, they do have a point. After about 10 weeks or so, maybe we should sort of start introducing pro-life laws. You don't hear that kind of discussion from the evil side. And yet over here, we have this constant backpedaling, don't hurt people's feelings, don't appear judgmental, don't be uncharitable, oh, don't say that, that's hateful speech. What do you mean you're right? We've lost the sense of who we are as Catholics, even good Catholics, Catholics who go to Mass, Catholics who go to adoration, who say the rosary, they have been nipped away at the edges. So much so that when you start to have a conversation with somebody, another Catholic will come over about the faith, another Catholic will come over and say, well, yeah, you shouldn't say it quite exactly like that. I mean, don't say it like that. The faith is all about showing forth the division that exists so that highlighted now something can be done about it some people will choose to take the truth and change their lives 
because for whatever reason, the truth comes crashing in on them. Generally, a hardened, committed sinner needs a hardened, committed belt up against the head to realize, oh, I'm wrong. Not always, but sometimes. Other people you can sit down and sort of reason with because they have a good heart, and for whatever reason, they're disposed to hear the truth, but they just need to hear it. We have an example of that in the Acts of the Apostles, when Philip the deacon is inspired by the Holy Spirit to go over to the Ethiopian eunuch who's sitting there reading the scriptures. He doesn't have a hard heart at all. He, Philip walks up and says, do you understand what you're reading? And he just says, no, how can I? I don't want anybody to tell me what this means. So Philip jumps in, the chariot explains to him what it all means, and by the time the conversation's over, he baptizes him. There's a fellow with a good heart. You don't have to say anything directly confronting to him because he's in love with the truth. He doesn't understand it totally. He doesn't know exactly where to go to get it, but he receives it when he hears it. He's the good soil that the seed lands on and is able to grow and produce a rich harvest. Other people won't hear it. And so our Lord calls them out. He says to the Pharisees, And remember, there's this conversation going on in John chapter 7 and John chapter 8 between our blessed Lord and the Pharisees, and they're challenging his authority. They ask him the question, you know, where do you have your authority to do this from, and, you know, all of this, and Jesus kind of, you know, he understands their hearts are hardened against him. And so there is no, well, let's sit down and have a pleasant conversation with you. He says, your father is the devil. That's what he says to them. They're all over there. Oh, Abraham is our father. Who are you? Are you say you're greater than Abraham? Jesus says, yeah, as a matter of fact, yes. <laughs> Before Abraham came to be, I am. How can you say you're greater than Abraham? How can, you, how can you say you're older than Abraham? You're not yet 50 years old. Your father is the devil because you do your father's will. If you were of my father, you would recognize me. That's hard language. Has anyone ever walked up to you and said, your father's the devil? And remember the context of that, too. We would kind of hear that in our 21st century Western mind as just saying you're kind of associated with the devil. You're kind of doing the devil's stuff. We certainly wouldn't look at it as a compliment. But the Jews of the day, remember, who were all about that DNA, that if you were a son, genetic, biological son of Abraham, you were saved, and all the rest were condemned. For Jesus, for our Lord to go straight at that to them and say, your father is the devil, that cut off their understanding of the biological genesis coming from Abraham and moves the entire argument over here to the spiritual and says, you're doing the bidding of Satan. There's very little else our blessed Lord could say that was more in their face, a knockout punch, than that. And so insulted were they by that comment that at the end of that passage we hear, and they went away and plotted how to kill him. That was it. A little lesson to us that when you say the truth, you're going to get a lot of enemies very fast. Oh well, who cares? As long as you have God as your friend, who cares what happens in regard of your enemies? Enemies. Enemies on this earth come to an end. Either you die and get away from them, or they die and you have a vacation. <laughs> you do not want God as an enemy. And yet people set themselves up in opposition to God as an enemy all the time. This is the reason the church on earth exists. There is no organization, there's no government, there's no uh, non-government organization, there's no United Nations, there's no League of Nations, there's no NATO, Warsaw Pact countries, nothing, nothing can save the world except the Catholic Church. That is its reason for being, that is its charter, is to save souls. Everything else is wrong, totally, 
or partially, our blessed Lord did not say to anyone else, you are the salt of the earth. The salt of the earth. Why would he use that expression? Salt, back in the day, was a very, very valuable commodity. It was so valuable that it's largely what the Roman soldiers were paid with. It was more valuable than gold. Why? Because it could preserve food. And if it preserved food, then you were able to keep living. As nice and shiny as gold is, it makes a really horrible biscuit with your tea in the morning. <laughs> ah, but salt allows you to eat meat and preserve your food and keep going. It was so valuable, salt, that they were paid for it, it's where we get our English word salary from. S-A-L, salt. So when our Lord says you are the salt of the earth, he's saying you are the greatest thing on the earth. You keep life on the earth. Catholics. And how do you do that? By being sons of God. By fighting for the truth. None of the apostles ever had a doubt in their mind that they were in a war. None of them. That's why they all died for the faith with the exception of John. And it's easy for us to say, well, John wasn't a martyr. John had a pretty miserable life. He was su certainly suffering a white martyr. And how would you like to live in a cave for the last 34 years of your life? So our Lord also says, you are the light of the world. What happens if there's no light? Everything dies. What happens if there's no salt? Everything dies. The church is the vehicle for providing life to the world. But, perhaps in anticipation of our own times and many others, our Lord says, but what happens when the salt loses its flavor? It's good for nothing, good for nothing, except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You've lost the reason for being. Salt has no purpose except to preserve the food. That's it. Light has no purpose except to shine forth. If it doesn't shine forth and provide illumination, it has no purpose. The church must be about the business of saving souls. Without the church saving souls, it has no reason for being. Now, when we look at the forces of evil and the forces of darkness in the world today, they are all very certain of their reason for being. You will never see the militant homosexual crowd movement back down. They always want more. You will never see the pro-abortion forces back down and want to compromise. They always want more. All of these forces of evil are very certain who they are, what their mission is, and they will not stop until they get it and get as much as they possibly can. And the reason they have been so successful is because we have forgotten who we are. The clergy, the laity, generation after generation now, two, three generations, the fourth generation is being born into nothing but a malaise of confusion. Who are we? Here is who you are. You are the baptized sons of God. You are the inheritors of the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That is the only reason you are breathing right now. That's it. To get you and everyone you can in your orbit to heaven is the only reason blood is pumping through your heart, why air is filling your lungs and your mind is attentive. That's it. That's it. Salt has one purpose. Light has one purpose. So what's gone wrong? What's gone so terribly wrong? We have acquiesced to the world. Now, that sounds all grand and noble and conceptual all the way up there in the stratosphere of thought. But how does that play out in our daily lives? How has the faith spread? It's not spread because the Pope stands on the logia and says, new evangelization. 
It's not spread because some chancery office somewhere produces, makes an office of the new evangelization. It's spread because you and I sit down with an individual and we talk. That's how the faith is spread. That's how the faith has always been spread. The faith has been taught in classrooms and from the pulpit and uh, you know, through various examples and reading books and the writings of the saints and the uh, different things that the doctors and fathers of the church have produced and the different encyclicals. That's how the faith is taught, but the faith is spread person to person because you are that grain of salt because I am that speck of light. And you come into contact with someone and you begin to share. And that means our own families. That means our friends, our mates at college, our co-workers, all of them. And so what does that mean in the process? It means you start to diminish yourself, myself we begin to go away. Because you're going to be crucified. You will be crucified. Some of us may be crucified literally, but we'll all be crucified at least figuratively. You have to be. You can't come out of the tomb on Good Friday, uh, on Easter Sunday, without having gone through Good Friday first. You know, every single thing our Lord does, He sets the example for us. He shows the way. The way to Easter Sunday is right through Golgotha on that cross. Now, we don't want to get lost here in the, uh, again, too much in sort of the romantic and the nostalgic. What does this mean in the right down here on the ground on the day-to-day? -day? It means when somebody who is a friend of yours or a family member of yours is Catholic and is getting married outside the church, you can't go. And you have to tell them why you can't go. It means if you have a friend of yours or friends who are uh, cohabitating, you need to say that's immoral. And not just that's immoral, you're going to hell, let's go get a beer. But you need to tell them why. You need to not only say what the church teaches, you need to understand why the church teaches that. You need to drown yourself in the teachings of the church. I need to do that. This is what it is to be Catholic. You can't love what you don't know. Because, oh, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. Yeah, you know, that's kind of a Protestant personalized thing. I have my little personal faith here. I have my little devotional life. I love Jesus, I love Jesus. Yeah, but I'm not going to go out there and offend Aunt Harriet. Oh, we can't bring up that topic. You know how that goes. We have to say what the truth is. And we particularly have to say what the truth is when we know the person is hostile toward hearing it. Because, salt of the earth, where else are they going to get the flavor? Who's going to say it to them? Everything we do is about bringing the truth to people. There's a wonderful priest who uh, died in 2000 in Detroit. His name is uh, Father John Harden. Some of you may be familiar with his writings. Um, his cause for beatification and canonization is ongoing. He said, and this is a very, very, very key thing, he said, any Catholic that is not about the business of evangelization might never entertain a hope for the beatific vision. That means our faith isn't private. Sure, there's a personal aspect to our faith. I have my devotions. I have my particular spiritual reading that I like, etc. But even that is just sort of personal to me so that I may go out to others. Our blessed Lord said to the apostles, freely you have received, now freely give. What's the last thing he said as he ascended to heaven? Go out and baptize all nations. Teach them to observe everything I have commanded you. You will be my witnesses. And that word witness comes from the Greek word for martyr. 
You will be my martyrs to the ends of the earth. But we don't want to see things like this because it's just too bloody comfortable sitting in the middle of the 21st century to sit back and just complain about things, to get into our own little groups and just complain. And we certainly don't want to go offend anybody, and gee, I don't understand, and we come up with a million and one excuses, two and a half million excuses. Well, if I say something to her, that'll cut off the communication. Oh, well! What communication of effect do you have right now with somebody who you're allowing to stay in a state of mortal sin because you haven't told them? What hope are you sitting here waiting to happen when you keep your mouth shut about what the truth is? What are you hoping? That the Blessed Mother will appear to them? Yeah, that lets us off the hook, doesn't it? We'll let God perform a miracle in their lives. Meanwhile, we'll just stay over here and keep quiet. That is not what Catholicism is about. Ask the apostles. Every one of them lost their lives because they opened their mouths. But we're willing to accept that because it's easy, because that's what the world wants, and we don't want to be about the business of confronting. And so we easily gobble up the world's uh, uh, covers for these things. Don't hurt people's feelings. Well, you know, you might drive them away. They already are away. What you're trying to do is pull them in. Somebody going to Mass who's practicing contraception or committing adultery or cohabiting with somebody, the few people who go to Mass who would do that, they're not doing themselves any favors. What are they doing? They're going there for some psychological self-fulfillment, self-esteem thing. You think somebody coming up to receive Holy Communion in a state of grace, is receive, in a state of mortal sin, is receiving any graces or merits for that? They're adding sacrilege. And we know this, and we need to say something. Now, you can't control the person. You know, this is all free will. But you have to get up and say what the truth is. You have to say the truth. Are you a king... My kingdom is not of this world. It is for this reason I came into the world, to bear witness to the truth. All who hear the truth hear my voice. So how selfish is it for Catholics who have the fullness of the truth to keep that truth to themselves? It's either cowardly or among the most uncharitable things you could possibly do to not say the truth. If you knew somebody's child was in danger of some horrible thing happening to them, walking into a burning house fire, uh, I don't know, some child molester guy getting into their presence, whatever it was, and you kept your mouth shut, how horrible would that be? What a scoundrel! it would take for somebody to keep their mouth shut under those kinds of circumstances. And yet here we're just talking about the physical well-being of somebody. And as horrible as those circumstances are, they pale in comparison to the spiritual well-being of someone. No matter what happens to a body here on earth, if that body is saved, if that person is saved, then what happened to them in the long run is immaterial. But if somebody is damned, that's forever. You know this truth. I know this truth. We don't get to acquiesce to the world saying we don't want to hear the truth. Let's say you're standing in front of somebody who is in some perilous spiritual state and you know it for whatever reason. It's at your attention. They're bragging to you about whatever it is. And as you're standing here talking, you have our blessed Lord on one side and Satan on the other. Which one of these two wants you to stay quiet? It's very easy understanding Catholicism. Everything about Catholicism is very simple and very straightforward. It's very black and white. Gray is Satan's favorite color. Everything about the faith is black and white. I was talking to Father beforehand, and he removed the Blessed Sacrament from the chapel, so we're here. So we're going to have the conference in here. Is that Jesus, or is it not? It's black or white. When you were baptized, 
Is original sin removed? Or is it not? When you go and make a good confession and you hear, I absolve you from all of your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, are you absolved or are you not? When you say, I do, I do, are you married or are you not? Everything about the faith is just a very simple proposition. Everything about the faith is a simple proposition. It's just yes or no, good or evil, heaven or hell. That's it. Archbishop Sheen used to say that there are a million different paths that people can take. And a million different people will take a million different paths. And at the end of their lives, they will step into eternity and they will see one of two faces. They will either see the sweet, loving, beautiful face of our blessed Lord, or they will see the horrible, terrible countenance of Satan. But each of them will say the exact same thing to each one of us. Come, you're all mine. This is what we are playing for, playing in the church. Everything, everything is what we're fighting for. Souls, immortal souls. We're not fighting for our reputation. We're not fighting for people to like us. We're not fighting for, uh, to develop some 27-year plan that in our brilliance we have figured out how this person is going to be brought back into the church. And we will do it without offending anyone. That plan has never worked. If it had worked, our Lord would have implemented it. It doesn't work. First of all, you have no idea if that person has 27 years. Second of all, you're not the only person working on that person. Hell is working on that person as well. And as long as that person is in a state of mortal sin, they are a tool of the devil. See, we forget all of this, don't we? We know it. We understand it down deep when somebody hops on a plane and comes over from the far side of the world and this big Irish-American mouth and says it. You're like, yeah, I, I, I remember this stuff. But we don't live it every day. We don't think of it in these terms every day. But evil does. Do you ever think there's a moment that Satan stops wanting to drag a soul into hell? The first pope in the first encyclical, which is sitting right there in the New Testament, says, beware your opponent, the devil is roaming about like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Well, did that stop being true in the year 366? It's just as true today as it was then. So if the first pope had such urgency about it, why do we not get to have such urgency about it? Why do we have to think in terms of something else that the world which he controls now presents in front of us as the real way to do things? Don't forget that Satan, the diabolical, watches us every step of the way, understands us every step of the way. We're nothing new. Not one of us is some new novelty to the powers of hell. Not one. They have watched billions of us. They understand human nature a heck of a lot better than we ever will in this life. They understand us. They watch our weaknesses. They know exactly what strategy to come after to use against us, and they do. And when we are unaware, as so much of the world is, that there is access to fight off this evil through the grace of our blessed Lord given to us in the Catholic Church and we do not avail ourselves of that, we are lost. That's why our Lord established the church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
So in the 21st century, like this is something new, it's only new to us, you can imagine people standing around in the middle of the 18th century saying, oh, this is the 18th century. How ridiculous that crazy religion stuff is. It's not like we're those primitive things back in the dark ages. No, we say the same things today, right? We have this same attitude. Because human nature always thinks that wherever it is, when it's encapsulated into an individual, that individual always thinks they know so much more, they've got so much more smarty pants than the people before them. Especially when you're 16 years old. Um, <laughs> and this is how Satan ensnares people. Now, if you go through the various things uh, that are kind of the themes I guess you could call them, that are kind of prevalent among the different members of the church today. Certainly not, you know, official teaching or magisterial uh, truths or de fide uh, things we accept, but just themes, kind of popular notions in the church today. One of those popular themes is that just about everybody goes to heaven. You know, those Hitler guys don't. But I'm not Hitler. There are lots of people who, given the opportunity, would be Hitler. History just didn't unfold in such a way for them to become Hitler. There was a uh, study done, uh, concluded in Europe, I think this was uh, about two months ago, and it was believed up until this study did this deep analysis, it was believed that the German, uh, the Nazi death camp and all of the supporting camps and mental health, mental health centers and the extermination things and the slave labor camps and all of that, it had been believed up to that point that there were about 5,000 such centers uh, participating in some manner in the Nazi uh, uh, eugenics machine program. This study, this research study, which was about four years in the making, revealed that there were something closer to 45,000 hospitals for torture, slave labor camps, support camps, the death camps, all of this stuff, that the infrastructure of the Nazi killing machine was much more far-flung than anyone had ever imagined up to this point. And the, the analysis of this report said it's nearly impossible to suspect that the average German just did not know what was going on. Because there's no way based on the numbers. You couldn't have 45,000 institutions, death camps, slave labor camps, uh, all the different things they had, because you had to have people staffing them. Well, how many people do you take, it would take hundreds of thousands of people to staff uh, an infrastructure like that. So it's easy for us to point at someone like Hitler and say, oh, what a horrible, evil guy. Adolf Hitler never climbed on top of a, uh, a, a gas chamber and shook the Zyklon B into it and killed 3,000 people in 20 minutes every half hour, 48 times a day. Adolf Hitler never fired a gun in a uh, a forest in the Ukraine. He never directed death squads to go do their things. He never saw any of this stuff. But tens of thousands of people under him did. So this idea that Hitler is somehow the paragon of evil, no, Hitler is the paragon of famous evil. So this idea that we have in our head that everybody goes to heaven, God wouldn't throw anyone into hell. That's true. God wouldn't throw anyone into hell, and he doesn't. But we don't have any concept. We really don't, as Catholics, we have bought little by little. We maybe haven't eaten it the whole meal. We ha probably haven't gone back to the buffet of the world's philosophy 75 times and filled our plates up, but we've nibbled at it. Some of us have taken a couple of bites filled up our drinks a little bit, sat down, kind of gotten comfortable with it. St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine each said that most people are damned. 
St. John Chrysostom said, most clergy are damned. Now, these aren't defide magisterial dogmas of the church, but when you start looking at the quality of the saints and the fathers and the doctors of the church, who time after time after time keep saying this, a reasonable Catholic mind is going to go, hmm, could all of these saints be wrong? Is everybody really saved? What do we teach as a church? How, do you, how are you saved? You have to die in a state of grace. Just glance around the world, salt of the earth, and do a reasonable interior assessment, just glancing at what you think, because we don't know, but what you think as you look around the world, do you think there's billions of people walking around in a state of grace? That's a very, very uncomfortable thought when we start having it, isn't it? But it becomes the driving force for the mission. If most people are saved, if most people go to heaven, then the eternal Word of God who incarnated and came to earth to die to redeem us and save us really overstated his case. He went through all that suffering to save a bunch of people who are just going to be saved anyway? We don't like talking about this stuff. We don't like causing division. When our blessed Lord was born, Herod slaughtered innocent children because of the division that the birth of Christ caused or presented to him. Our blessed mother and St. Joseph take Jesus into the temple for the uh, presentation in the temple and over rushes Simeon who takes the babe from her arms, blesses God, now I can die. What you have promised me has happened. A light to the nations and the glory of your people. Here you go, mother. This child shall be responsible for the fall and rise of many in Israel. A sign that is to be contradicted and a sword your own soul shall pierce so that the secret thoughts of many may be laid bare. Christ exposes the division and forces people to choose. When our Lord walks into a place, He says, do you believe? Yes or no, do you believe? And you must choose. We must choose. And it's been that way ever since. Who do people say the Son of Man is, my apostles? Imagine that scene for a moment. Our Lord takes them up to Caesarea Philippi, region dedicated to Caesar and the false gods of Pan. And he asks them, oh, you guys have been out, you know, I, I empowered you to go out and you know, perform miracles and preach and prepare the towns. And, so who do people say that I am? And they're all yucking it up. Well, some of John the Baptist back from the dead. Oh, it's Elijah. Oh, it's a prophet. Here's all. Ah, oh, that's very good. Who do you say that I am? Whoop. Not a word. No bevy of opinions coming out then when it's what other people think. Oh, they're all free with the tongues. When it's what do you think, silence. It takes an act of God the Father to reveal to Simon who Jesus is. And then filled with the grace of that act, he blurts out who Jesus is. You're the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. But only Peter says that. When our Lord presents himself, people must choose. That's what he wants. The choice must be made. 
We don't get to live in the land of lukewarm. In the book of Revelation, St. John's Apocalypse, our Lord reveals in a vision to John, he goes to seven churches, and their faith, the faith of each of these seven churches in what is today uh, modern-day Turkey, the Romans called the province Asia Minor, their faith, the faith of each of these individual churches, or we'd probably call them dioceses today, is represented by a lampstand. And our Lord goes to these, each of these individual churches, and he gives them kind of a report card. And he says, your faith is good here, your faith is, you know, you, you, you love me, but this is wrong. I will take away your lampstand. He goes to the church of Laodicea, and he says, your original love for me has grown cold. You have become lukewarm in the faith, and I will take away your lampstand. Be hot or be cold, but do not be lukewarm. The lukewarm, I will catch it, vomit out of my mouth. And that's to people who are baptized. Remember, all of the New Testament is not written to atheists. It's not written to Baptists. It's not written to Lutherans. It's not written to, you know, Manichaeans. It's written to baptized Catholics. And there is very little in the New Testament, particularly in the letters of St. Paul, that are not either an encouragement to stay holy or a smackdown for not having remained holy. That essentially sums up all of the letters of St. Paul. And as we think about how does this kind of thing play in our lives, our lives today, here in the 21st century, as members of the church militant, fighting against evil, because that's what we're doing. That's why you're baptized. That's why you're baptized. It's not to get into a better Catholic school. It's not to like associate with these people who are fun and cool, and this is my heritage that I got from my parents and grandparents, and we were immigrants. We can, it has nothing to do with it has nothing to do with that's just simply how the faith was transmitted to you but now that you are the possessor of it you must do something with it and you must go out and save your port your portion of the world that's it save yourself and every single other soul you can and yes you will be crucified for that too bad rejoice and be glad for your reward will be great in heaven. What do we think Jesus Christ is talking about when he's saying these things to us? Blessed are you when men persecute you and revile you and speak all kinds of calumny and hatred about you. For my name's sake, rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. For such as it was for the prophets who they persecuted before you. What's he talking about? That we're going to have to be upset what our mother-in-law is going to think because we said, oh, you know, that wedding isn't really a good thing. They shouldn't be living to, with each other. How embarrassing will it be to be in heaven with the first and second century martyrs if, God willing, we're able to be there? And we're all sitting around in some great big conversation around a table, and they're all saying about how they had to undergo these horrors of you know, being thrown in jail and prisons and shipped off to these horrible mines of the Roman Empire, and they were eventually dragged out and thrown into some amphitheater where beasts ripped their arms off and chewed their heads off and everything else, and then we're going to sit there and say, oh, but, you know, I had to put up with my mother-in-law. <laughs> we have to get out of the idea, because it's what the world, meaning Satan, wants us thinking. They want us thinking in this condition that the worst thing on earth is to hurt someone's feelings. There's a name for that. It's called sentimental theology. It's a derisive name, but it sums it up. There was a priest who wrote an article. Somebody emailed it to me three, four weeks ago. And I read it, and I couldn't believe I was reading it when I looked at the date. The date was 1940. And the name of the article was Sentimental Theology. And it said, I'm paraphrasing, the greatest crime 
in the church today is that we teach something with our first concern being, are someone's feelings going to be hurt by the truth? I couldn't believe this was written 70 years ago. And the priest got just persecuted for that article. He said in the, uh, in the article, uh, I went into, the, the reason I'm writing this article is because I went into a uh, Catholic gathering and the topic of hell came up. This is 1940. And the topic of hell came up. And when I brought it up, a good number of Catholics in the room jumped down my throat, however he phrased that for 1940. They jumped down my throat and said, Father, that's ridiculous. What are you talking about? We can't talk like that's offensive. Blah, 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 blah. This article could have been written in 2013. So we have been long prepared, long conditioned for this to simply sit back and keep our mouths shut. St. Catherine of Siena said, Silence, silence, I am sick of silence. Let a hundred thousand tongues ring out that all the evil in the world is due to silence. Pope Pius said, All the evil in the world is due to lukewarm Catholics. Are you getting the drift? Saints, Scripture, popes, fathers, doctors, our blessed Lord Himself. You cannot say, I'm a Catholic, and keep your mouth shut. If you don't love your neighbor enough to tell them that they're doing something wrong, then you have violated the second commandment. And because God wants that person saved and you have kept your mouth shut, you have violated the first in the process. That person's soul is more important to God than your feelings about how they will feel about you once you've said something. You don't get to go to weddings where God is mocked. You don't get to hang out with friends whose lives reflect an absolute refutation of everything you walk into a church on Sunday and go up and receive. We can't live lives at odds like that. One, that needle will tip finally one way or the other. Our blessed Lord even said, don't be lukewarm. Be hot or be cold. Yet we hear this all the time. We see this all the time. Don't give offense. No one really goes to hell. How many of you have been to a Catholic funeral that turned into a canonization of the person in the coffin? <laughs> Bob's fantastic. He's up there right now golfing. <laughs> you have no Those funerals are for the soul of the deceased so that all of us here gathered will pray for the person, hoping and trusting that at least he or she is in purgatory and helping pray them to heaven. When I'm dead, I don't want one word said about my life. I just want prayers. That's all I care about. If the Holy Spirit wants to go on and do something different, well, then that's the Holy Spirit's business. For my part, all I want is prayers. It doesn't do me any good if I'm sitting there going, ouch, 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 and someone's over here at a pulpit saying, oh, he really liked golfing. <laughs> when you think about what happened, how the church understood what hell is, and still does officially, but we just don't hear it anymore because unofficially, we don't want to hurt people's feelings. Don't talk about those things, you know? I would go up here as Father Smith and talk about abortion and same-sex marriage and, you know, adultery and fornication and masturbation and everything, but, you know, it's just going to upset. You know, God loves you. <laughs> Love each other. Now let me tell you a little meaningless story about my life that you'll all sit and enjoy and chit-chat about and everything and chuckle and hee-hee and ha-ha. And when you walk out the door, you'll have forgot the meaningless garbage I spewed forth because I didn't want to hurt your feelings. That's not a homily. 
That's not the way the faith is transmitted. The faith needs to be challenged in each one of us. We need to stand up as men. This includes you too, ladies. We need to stand up as men, as sons of God, and go out and conquer the world. That's what we're commissioned for. When our Lord says to St. Peter and to the other apostles, the gates of hell will not prevail, that is an attack on hell. Gates don't attack. Gates are a defensive thing. You keep the gates shut to keep the enemy out. Prior to the church being here on earth, visibly present here on earth as a means of salvation, as the means of salvation, prior to being publicly here at Pentecost, hell was on the offensive. It's why our Lord says at the Last Supper, now is the prince of this world driven out. He's driven out because the king is coming. When the king comes, the prince leaves. So the king is about to mount his throne the day after the Last Supper, and now the prince is driven out. Now he's driven into a defensive position, and the church is on the attack. The church militant, the military, put on the armor of God. I have fought the good fight. This happens internally with us. We must overcome the evil in our own lives. It doesn't go away, but we must master it. Whatever it is, sex, power, drugs, whatever, love of money, gossip, whatever it is, that must be mastered and continue to be mastered every day in our lives so that we will be effective soldiers in the church militant to go out and save the world. This is the purpose of our baptism. It's why you go up and receive Holy Communion. So that the DNA of God Himself will unfold in us and wrap itself around us, preparing our bodies for resurrection on the last day and nourishing us to give us the verve and the vigor we need to go out and fight now. That's how we get to heaven. Not sitting back just in our private little rooms with our private devotions, keeping our mouths shut and bemoaning the condition of the world. If you want to know the condition of the church, look at the condition of the world. If the world is generally good and moral, it's because the church, the only means to salvation and the bulwark against evil, is doing its job. If the world is falling apart and going to hell, it's because the church militant has become the church cowards. And yes, there is a line in the book of Revelation that is a very disturbing line. When John lays out the list of the damned, these will not enter heaven. Right smack on the top of that list are cowards. Cowards will never see heaven. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Of course it makes sense. Who's in heaven? Heroes. Giants of the faith. That's who's in heaven. These are the ones, as our Lord says, who have persevered till the end. We do this here in life. We don't build statues to cowards. We don't have big national memorial veterans type days for cowards. We have it for the heroes. We have it for the people who sacrificed their lives, who threw themselves on the grenade to save their mates, who led the charge up the hill and destroyed or defeated the enemy in the face of all kinds of guns blazing and whatever it is that we build statues to them. We name cities after them. We name streets after them. We throw parades in their honor. We station guards around their tomb 24 hours a day and call it the tomb of the unknown soldier because of his great love for his country. Well, if we do that here on earth in an earthly society, how much more is that nobility reflected in the heavenly society? It's saints. Saints are the heroes of the faith. They're the people who persevered to the end, who gave it all they had because that's what love demands. That's what love wants. When our blessed Lord says, 
be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. The only way to be perfect is to give everything. Everything. Not one ounce of us left. And we will be perfect. And we will be in heaven. And we will be saints. And we will have achieved the goal for which we were created. And anyone else that we were able to bring along in that process, all the better. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Do not listen to the satanic, diabolical voices in the world that play around in your head because you hear them on the radio, you see them on TV, you hear them in the chatter of your family and your friends who are not in a state of grace and are therefore instruments of Satan. Stand up and fight those forces in whatever way you can in the circumstances of your lives. We are not the church of retreat. We are the church that went out and subdued an empire. Twelve men. Twelve men. And that's why we're all sitting here today. That's why we're here. Because it all traces back to them. Because they loved to the very last drop and they conquered the world. And we have fallen asleep and the world has swarmed back. If 12 men could do that in the backwaters of the empire, think of what a hundred good people could do on every continent in the world. St. John Vianney said that Satan once said to him, if there were four priests like you, my empire would come to an end. Four. Four. So we wake up in the morning and we say, do I want to be a saint? The answer has to be yes. And it has to be an enthusiastic yes. Do I want to be a saint? Yeah, I want to be a saint. Do whatever you have to do with me, Jesus. Use me to save souls. Use me to save souls. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. St. Michael the Archangel. Defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Sacred Heart of Jesus, Immaculate Heart of Mary, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.